What up y'all, back at it again with Defending Another Classic. Red Dead 1 was the game that introduced us to the goaded John Marston, so it is my obligation to defend the second greatest video game of all time. Today's target is GCN, another one of these Cinema Sins robot clones. His video was 35 minutes long, so let's see how long this video will be. As I said in the Red Dead 2 video, don't send hate to GCN. While he may be an idiot, he doesn't deserve, you know, people hating on him. So, take it easy, take a chill pill and enjoy dismantling every argument against Red Dead 1. Health benefits of smoking is a bit of a stretch even in this time period where diseases like tuberculosis were common. And especially in a game where there are shops that actually sell medicine, merchants with tonics that are medical breakthroughs, and the ever-changing landscape of the West, science has pretty much disproven any ignorance in advertising that smoking is good for you. Like this commenter said, smoking was advertised as healthy up until the 1950s. Hell, look at these early 1900s ads promoting smoking first documented footage of someone boarding a hype train. That leads into a somewhat overrated game that, quite frankly, doesn't get good until the start of the Mexico section. Hey, somebody needed to have the balls to say it. Apparently I'm the only one willing to step up. You're half right. While the new Austin chapter is slow with weak missions, I still had fun messing around with Dickens and raiding Fort Mercer. For this, I won't be removing or adding a sin. For one, I'm grateful, Mrs. Bush, that they are finally bringing civilization to this savage land. I could not agree with you more, my dear. My daddy settled this land and I know he'll be looking down on us. Please, how we help the natives. Rockstar, I'm gonna have to send you for a bit of inaccuracy here. People talked way worse than this back in those times. I never expected you of all game developers to play it safe. I mean, I guess, but I also doubt everybody was just cursing like a sailor at the very mention of uncivilized land. That's Bonnie McFarlane in a train on her way to Armadillo, even though we find out later on she owns and runs her own ranch near Armadillo. And I would have accepted the excuse she was going to get supplies, but she doesn't appear to be carrying any. Plus, she has plenty of people working on her ranch to do that for her. And yes, in case anyone tries to mention it, I am aware that in the epilogue of Red Dead Redemption 2, if you travel to the McFarlane ranch, one of the farmers will tell you that the McFarlanes are away. The fella here had some bad luck himself. Him and his family got hit hard by the sickness. Him and his daughter went off traveling. Trying to deal with the sadness, I guess. But if after that four-year gap, everyone is going to try to convince me that Bonnie McFarlane returns home the same day that John leaves for Armadillo and that they board the same train together, I am calling some massive bullshit plot convenience. Either way, it's a sin. What would be so bad about that? Real-life coincidences are way weirder. Like Abraham Lincoln's son saved John Wilkes Booth's brother from getting caught under a train. I can accept the fact that John and Bonnie board the same train at the same time. Bill, I've come for you! Considering that Jake had already told John he was hired by the Marshal, and that John ends up assisting the Marshal anyways, it would have been wise for John to get help from the Marshal so that he would have backup for taking down Bill Williamson. What in the hell made John think he was going to eliminate Bill at Fort Mercer on his own? Especially when Bill ends up having the high ground. John pretty much hates any law enforcement, so yes, it makes sense John wouldn't go out to see Marshal Johnson until he sees that there's no other way. Also, John still wanted to help Bill out. They had considered each other brothers, you know, before. John only tried something stupid once he realizes Bill isn't going to take his help. Double sin here. One, John survives this. And two, Bill follows the classic villain cliche of not making sure the protagonist is dead, thus allowing them to survive and return to finish their job. John needs to survive this or else it wouldn't be a game to explore. Like I said in my Everything Wrong With Everything Wrong With Red Dead 2 video, the main character gets special privileges. Also, Bill is pretty dumb, meaning he would have thought John did die from the shot. You can't sit in characterization. Cost us fifteen dollars. How are you gonna voluntarily rescue John only to complain about how much it costs to save his life? You run a ranch. You know that medicine doesn't come cheap. Maybe I don't get it, but Bonnie didn't really complain. She just told him the bill. Should have left me there to die. Yes, John. Leave you there to die when the whole point of you taking on this duty is to bring closure to your past and gain amnesty so that you can see your wife and child again. Alive. Like John himself says, he wasn't really thinking, so that's why he tried to take on Bill alone. When it comes to you should have just left me there to die, that's just how John talks. He's a very he's very modest and self-deprecating. Feeling better, why not take a ride with me later and help me patrol the perimeter? You can earn back some of that money we wasted on doctor's bills. That last sentence does not make any sense. You willingly spent money on John to save his life, but now you want to offer him money to help out with something you do on a regular basis, being a rancher? Do you need the Twitch Hydration Bot to help you out with that thirst? The last line was a little jab at John, and yes, Bonnie is thirsty for John. The last time she sees him, she just kind of stares off at John and Abigail, reconsidering her crush. Do you mind riding with me to Armadillo? 
I've got to get some supplies and I could do with the company. Wait, if you were going to get supplies from Armadillo, what the hell were you doing in Blackwater? Well, at least you validated my sin from earlier. You didn't validate shit. You said in your own previous sins she could have been returning from her four year trip, meaning that's why she hasn't gotten supplies yet. If you're going to make a point, at least try to connect it. The guns in this game cost more than a piece of property, with them easily being hundreds of dollars. Dude, that's how much they cost now. It's a wonder how the West was ever expanded with prices that inflated. Honestly, I think it's just how money works in Red Dead. It was messy in Red Dead too, so it'll be messy here. That's obviously not as bad, so I'm just not gonna remove a sin. That fella from the train company. No, I'm from Fort Mercer. What a completely pointless misunderstanding. The deputies know that the marshal sent for a man named John, and John doesn't need to say he's from Fort Mercer, knowing damn well the whole town knows about Bill Williamson and his gang held up in Fort Mercer. That's some of John Marston's fine sarcasm. Get used to it. This town's safe, not clean up to all of these three counties. I got a bunch of cattle rustlers out near Box Canyon need shutting down. The marshal claims that his job isn't to clean up all these counties, yet has no problem allowing John to help him accomplish exactly that without signing any agreement. Not to mention, Box Canyon isn't even on the map. I know. I, I mean, the two have a mutual agreement. They both want Bill Williamson gone. That seems reason enough to band together. And about Box Canyon, maybe it's just not important enough to put on the map. Not every single location will be put on the map. McFarland. I'm married. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have just witnessed history. Bonnie McFarlane is the first American woman to ever be friendzoned. John is very loyal to his wife in a world where most aren't. It makes sense for him to friendzone Bonnie. GCN really sinned John for his loyalty to a marriage. Are starting to realize why there haven't been too many Western games made. They're very, um, shall we say limiting herding cattle the most riveting gameplay on youtube oh and uh get used to it because you'll have to do it about three more times throughout the game i mean what else was there to do in the old west not like john could have loaded up modern warfare to pass the time herding cattle only happens four times in total where most missions involve shooting bad guys with badass aimbot if you want to sin repetitive gameplay you're sinning the wrong thing regenerative health it's a gameplay mechanic because you're playing a f game. You're here on some secret mission to uh, remove some undesirables from the county. Um, it's not a secret if you know the details of the mission. It still is a secret because Drew doesn't know exactly who, how, and why. Government sending out agents to covertly murder and control people, then I start to worry. I mean, yeah, all right, Williamson is a menace, and men like him are the plague. But isn't a government agent a worse menace? And all that symbolizes, I mean. Despite hearing all this wisdom from Mr. McFarlane, it will not clue in John that the government men who hired him are the real threat. John may be a fool, but he does take advice when it's given to him. John already knows that Ross is the real threat. It's just that John foolishly believes that doing what he says will guarantee him and his family's safety. Of dissonance where John spends this entire game trying to erase his outlaw past. Yet like all other Rockstar games, the only way to truly have fun is to be an asshole and murder people indiscriminately, which completely conflicts with the overall theme of redemption. What kind of psychopaths are you all that you find it fun to murder people for no reason? Sure it's fun once in a while, but does it ever get tiring putting people on train tracks? makes the honor system pointless since there's never any consequence for swaying either way. The only real difference is the way certain people will react to you when you're around them. Give me some major outcomes like honor specific weapons and outfits, affecting the outcome of the game, or rewarding me with more acres of land for my farm after completing townsfolk tasks. Anything to make the experience more unique. Sending Red Dead 1 for having a basic honor system. That's kind of the thing with first entries in a series, they usually lack in terms of their sequels. That's like sending Arkham Asylum for having basic free flow combat. Actual gameplay literally begins with button mashing. Of course you did that. Possibly go fetch him for me? Literal fetch questing. That's how side missions work. You can't send Red Dead for following basic game design. Group of bandits. We're getting drunk and murdering settlers. And you waited until now to deal with them? Not to mention, the bandits end up being at Ridgewood Farm, which seems to be the same distance if not further away than Fort Mercer, which you claimed was outside your jurisdiction. Maybe the marshal was waiting for a posse to rally up before taking out the bandits. Also, killing some low-life thieves is different than raiding a fort full of dangerous outlaws. I'd lie too and say that's out of my jurisdiction. Bastard. They're holed up in the farmhouse. This woman knows the bandits are in the farmhouse even though she was locked in this barn. She could have heard the bandits say, let's check out the farmhouse. She's not deaf. Ah! 
I see that the Wilhelms are like the stupids. They're an extended family. It's a popular reference that almost every project has, and it's even more popular in Western fleets. Time to head over to Pike's base and myself. I just wanted to let you all know I started this mission after I had already cleared out Pike's Basin, meaning there wouldn't be a gang to terrorize the McFarlands to begin with. And thus, there wouldn't be a gang to burn down the farm and escape without anyone noticing. Maybe John doesn't kill all of them. There's probably at least some that manage to escape and do this. But of course, the game can't account for the player clearing out every gang base, so some dialogue could be contradicted isn't immediately murdered by this gang after their predictable double cross and John killing half of them on his way to her. And yes, I do mean immediately murdered, as in shot dead so that John doesn't have a chance to save her. They leave her alive so that after killing John and the rest of the posse, they could do what they want with her. It's horrifically dark, but they mention it in the cutscene that started this mission. Tonic John Drinks is supposed to enable Deadeye, a gameplay mechanic you've been able to use up until this point. No, Dickens used John to peddle his product. John was already good at shooting, so saying that the tonic caused it would have incentivized the others to buy some. You think you can put a hole in a man's hat and just walk away, do you? Pretty sure that's what you asked for. Right! Let's just see how sharp you is with a moving target. But this guy is an asshole who didn't expect John to be able to shoot his hat. He was just looking for a fight. He's mine, oh mine. Seth will now act as your resident golem, complete with his own madness and an item that he obsesses over that'll do anything to obtain. Even though I hate Seth, I must defend him as he is part of Red Dead Redemption. It's just who he is as a character, a disgusting gremlin of a man. Sinning characterization. For one second, partner. I hate people. Seth is somehow an old friend of Wes Dickens, despite Seth hating people and Wes Dickens being a traveling salesman. There's a reason Dickens said old friend. Maybe the two met before Seth was all bonkers for his gold, or Dickens met Seth while scamming his tonic. Who knows, the goofies just know each other. It's some kind of nightmare. Yeah, only if you paid an extra $9.99. This joke got a chuckle out of me, but since you sinned Red Dead, I'm gonna sin you. Steal a horse and lose my wanted level, and then return to the very station where I stole said horse that caused me to gain a wanted level. I mean, there are dumber things in life, but not too many. The deputies were out looking for John, so nobody at the station would recognize it, or even know that he came back. Weapons! Armor plate for the wagon? That armor plating is gonna render itself pretty useless when you end up exposing the entire Gatling gun, and John along with it. What if the gang decided to just open fire to Dickens' wagon? John would have been shredded before he could even do anything. Better to be safe than sorry. The entire point of the horse race, which I won, was to gain prize money to get weapons and armor for the wagon, which you have yet to deliver on. The only thing more miraculous than your sales pitch is the fact that John hasn't put a bullet in your brain yet. I'm gonna guess that it's hard to buy armor and weapons for a wagon. It's something that would take some time. You just got done swindling us down at Cho Springs with this song and dance. Except the sales pitch actually worked when John demonstrated his Deadeye skill. Yeah, but they probably realized that the tonic they bought didn't actually do anything, hence why they are angry. Money to outfit my carriage, to turn a simple tradesman's vehicle into something more subterfuge. Something we should have already obtained from the previous horse race. Yet the game decides to waste your time with another horse race. Again, it's probably expensive turning a normal wagon into an armored Gatling gun on wheels. Are you guys starting to understand why I think this game doesn't get good until the Mexico section? The first half of this game has John with the patience of a Buddhist monk tolerating the trickery done by Seth, Irish, and Wes Dickens, and sometimes repeating the same missions just to pad out the playtime. Agreed. I see that John has the same weakness as the Uragon from Monster Hunter, except in John's case it means instant death. It's because of technical limitations at the time that Rockstar couldn't make water an actual gameplay mechanic. So instead in Red Dead 2 they made it canon that John can't swim. A Gatling gun doesn't work. John makes it seem like the machine gun malfunctioned on him, yet all it needs is ammo and it works perfectly fine. Yes, because a gun doesn't work without ammo, making John's statement correct. A gun without ammo is basically just a blunt weapon. John's not gonna go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Williamson gang armed only with an empty Gatling gun. It would be lame as hell if the gun the player has spent hours assembling ran out of ammo after 15 seconds. Sometimes gameplay needs to outweigh realism. Not removing a sin for the ride into Mexico. Take these sins. I hate to 
spoil a beautiful afternoon on such beautiful land. Look around you, John. It is clearly nighttime. So, technically, afternoon? Make Mexico great. He was getting raw, man. So John shooting them is just recompense. Man who handles a gun as sloppy as you. I can handle a gun, okay, partner. Yeah, as long as you're killing quail or peasants. But if you have to face another man, you don't stand a chance. And you do. I can show you a few tricks. Proceeds to show John how to shoot stationary bottles and birds, things that are far less threatening than peasants. You watch this cutscene. He literally tells John the right stance when shooting a gun. When you teach someone, you don't just throw them right to the test. You give them basic tips and let them try it out. Quite an effective confinement when you have an obvious opening someone could easily escape, especially when your captive isn't even tied up. Ricketts had to carry Louisa out, meaning she wasn't strong enough to climb over the door, so they didn't even bother tying her up. Not only is John carrying out more favors for the Mexican government without obtaining further information on the location of Bill and Javier, but DeSanto orders John to stop a train that he himself said there were no supplies on it. We will lure the rebels into a trap. There's a train leaving to Barossa soon. We're going to escort it. Yeah, it's a trap so they don't want to risk real supplies. Why is this a sin exactly? I guess the information thing, but like, what reason does the Mexican government have to just give John information? They obviously need something out of it, or else it wouldn't really be a deal. Game denies me of a Back to the Future 3 moment, and the fact that John was able to stop the train at that speed from that short of a distance. It's a game at the end of the day, not everything needs to be excruciatingly realistic. Let's burn down these casas that have already been demolished. It's baffling the rebels were able to hide here in the first place. It's to send a message, don't mess with the Mexican army. Yeah, in case you haven't noticed by now, this is the majority of the game. John tries to get information on Bill and Javier, comes across a crooked individual, said individual demands John to help them before they help him, John complies in aiding them, they continuously play coy after John assists them, culminating in one final mission where John finally gets what he needs to move forth. Lather, rinse, repeat. And here I was throwing shade at EA and Ubisoft for repetitive mission design. I won't let it slide just cause it's Rockstar. John is reluctant to help but he has no choice. How how can he find Bill or Javier in a country John knows almost nothing about? Sure, it's repetitive and it gets kind of boring, but it makes sense within the story. I hope you know how to use that gun! Well, maybe you shouldn't have ordered him to operate the Gatling gun if you didn't think he knows how to use it. But I wouldn't expect anything less from a literal handlebar twirling mustache villain. It's a sly remark to lighten the mood. They are both on a suicide mission, might as well have some final jokes but Uncharted 2 had a better train sequence a year prior to your release. Sitting a train sequence in a Wild West game. This is worth this many sins. Pretty sure sundown doesn't occur in 60 seconds when it's the middle of the day. Also, you don't need a stagecoach if you're just transporting one person. Video game time is different from real time, so these 60 seconds for us probably would have been like 6 hours in Red Dead time. Act normal. It's nothing to worry about. Yes, talk even louder so that they can hear your plan. There's a reason she spoke English here. The soldiers don't understand English. You know the men you hunt? They have been captured in Chupa Rosa. I want you and DeSanta to ride out there, and then you can take possession of them. John actually falls for this, especially considering Allende gave hints that he knows John is working for the rebels as well, and will view John as being a double agent, which ends up being the case anyway. Again, John really has no choice whether he wants to believe Allende or not. John's hands are constantly tied, so he has to take any lead he can on Bill and Javier. Mexican army ended up betraying John? I'll take things I predicted the moment I stepped into this region for 500, Alex. It was quite obvious, yeah, but that's just how the game works. Everyone hates Mike and what's up happening? He ratted out the Vandalins all along. Just because something is obvious doesn't mean it takes away any impact. Eh, maybe a little bit. John, would you like some extra chromium plating for this plot armor? It comes at a discount price when you purchase a package of our saving the hero cliches. Sinning John's plot armor. Being the main character, he kinda has to have it. It would be one sad ending if John just gets executed here and boom, that's it. Thank you for spending $60 on this. Uh, those are clearly handcuffs, not ropes. How would Reyes know? know that the Mexican army graduated top honors at the Stormtroopers School of Aiming. It's no wonder they've been having trouble with the rebels. He can't shoot at John because they're busy dealing with the rebels, which gives John a chance to run away. 
Weird how Louisa is so cautious about letting an ally like Marston near her, yet is so unbelievably naive about Reyes and how he feels towards her. He even called her the wrong name after John rescued him from execution. Man, this guy does not understand characterization. This is like the third sin where he complains about how a character acts. If it happens again, I'll just silently add a sin to the counter. But to counter it, I guess, is just... Louisa is that delusional. Ricketts even says it when he talks about how locals are hell bent on revolution. With explosives? A little. It's been a long time. Good. Because we do not. So if you didn't bring John, you wouldn't have anybody who knows how to handle explosives, thus this entire ploy would be pointless. Not a great plan. No, the plan would just be more dangerous. John coming along was an extra precaution. Wretched animal that Santa has been sent to oversee a massacre in El Sepulco. Come, we must stop him and finally kill that vermin. Proceeds to not accompany John in eliminating DeSanta when this is part of her revolution. She would just be a liability, as she isn't an experienced fighter. Hey boy, don't be absurd. I'm going to be the next president of Mexico. Except there's the manner of General Sanchez who has yet to be eliminated and is the puppet master behind Colonel Allende. Reyes knows this and marches to Mexico's capital after taking out Allende. So Reyes still ends up as Mexico's president. He knows about Sanchez. He knows about him. Man, it's been a long time. Hey. Hello, brother. It's uh, good to see you. I heard you was coming. You took your time, no? Come on, you're not gonna shoot your own brother, are you? We was family. You know, I am so glad I waited until after I played Red Dead Redemption 2 before sending this game so that I could call bullshit on this segment. Because from what I played, John and Javier barely had any interaction with each other, much less enough to call each other brother. This is more of a sin on Red Dead 2's part, as within Red Dead 1, yeah, they are established to be good friends, or at least they were good friends. He's not looking very healthy. We told you to keep them alive. Them? Do you see anybody besides Javier in John's possession? Besides, what difference does it make whether John brings him back alive? Your ultimate goal is to eliminate the remaining outlaws of the land. Fordham said them in case John had already killed Bill. So far the agents know almost nothing of John's progress, just the fact that Javier is dead. Double sin, but they wanted Javier alive to try him for his crimes. Can't give a dead body a trial, hence they get mad at John. Quick note, but you decided to kill Javier, so that's why they get mad and say them. Normally, I think so. You're at least supposed to bring in Javier alive. Just John Marsden casually strolling through mayhem with nobody attacking me, even though I've taken lives on both sides. They're busy fighting each other. Being cautious multiple times, Luisa thought she could just charge three armed men with a knife and survive. I mean, I guess that was supposed to be an emotional moment, but I feel as empty as the calories I intake whenever I eat a Krispy Kreme donut. Luisa is very irrational and delusional when it comes to Reyes, which is why she charged at the soldiers with a knife. One who let Dutch drive you insane! Dutch wanted you dead! We all did! Except for that Arthur Morgan guy who evidently risked his life to save John. Oh, and that Sadie Adler lady. Can't forget about her. Oh, and that Charles fella. He wasn't too keen on letting John die either. That's three people out of all the other gang members. Also, you can't sense something that the sequel expanded on. Rockstar didn't have the full backstory of the Vanderlyn gang figured out because it wasn't necessary. So in terms of Red Dead 1 lore only, the entire gang wanted to kill John. We know where he is. Then go and shoot him. No, sir. I want you to shoot him for me. That's going to be quite a moot point when you end up shooting Dutch anyway so that it would look good on your report, which will also end up being pointless when you order your men to kill John. You don't understand how corrupt Ross is, as he is using John to take out the gang. All the while, Ross will take credit to Bruce's career. Mr. Marston, <laughs> you're alive. Hello, Wes Dickens. <laughs> Ross, have him release this man. Why? Because he's a harmless old fraud, the kind of man that built this country. And because he helped me get Williamson. Technically, he only helped you in attacking Fort Mercer. It was Irish who helped you get to Mexico, which then led to Reyes aiding you in capturing Williamson. And who introduced John to Irish? You've robbed at least 40 banks that we're aware of. They told us there was a prize when you got to 50. <laughs> Man, John's sarcasm is on point, and I can appreciate that. So much so that I'll take off a few sins. Appreciating the golden writing that is John's dialogue, I will also remove a few sins. Your family is enjoying a much needed vacation, and in far more luxurious surroundings than those to which they are accustomed. It's true. 
While considering Jack was once taken captive by Angelo Bronte, who had vast amounts of wealth, luxury living isn't exactly a new experience for him. How would a 16 year old Jack remember how that felt? Again, you can't sin this game for something Red Dead to expand it on. Sport. Soon, there will be no buffalo left. Rockstar, come on. Did you really think you could have the same actor voice two different prominent characters and not have someone notice it or get distracted by it? Because if you did, you are dead wrong. One could say, Red Dead, no, fuck that, I'm not making that joke. I mean, projects can reuse voice actors, and even then, Benjamin Brian Davis did a pretty good job masking Dutch's iconic, iconic voice cracks. Yeah, you can still hear a few, but it's good. Shit, damn it, Dutch! Wait. Did you just say, damn it, Dutch? That was Nastas who just got killed. I think you got a little confused with the script there, John. I got the joke, but John is cursing Dutch for tricking these natives into fighting against each other, just like he did in Red Dead 2. And, and, and your friend there, the professor? We're gonna kill the both of you. Why you wanna do a thing like that? I don't know. Sport? I guess. Translation, I needed a reason to get back into the plot since Bill and Javier are dead. And this is the best I could come up with. Dutch is so crazy that he doesn't need to come up with a reason why he wants to kill. He just wants to kill freely. Because he's done being the charismatic leader he was in Red Dead 2. He's just gone. He is just fully engulfed by his bloodlust. He's told us some interesting news. Our mutual friend, Mr. Vanderlyn, is about to pay call on his bank manager. A bank manager would imply Dutch has money and signed legal documents, which begs the questions, why the hell is he still in Blackwater? And why wasn't the government able to trace him until now, especially when the bank is directly across from the bureau building? Dutch probably sent some of his men to scout ahead. Bank manager heard them and warned the bureau. No, Dutch obviously doesn't have a bank account. He's not, you know, getting credit or taking interest or anything like that. He's there to rob the place. Dutch's boys hitched them there. They'll have to run that way to make their escape. You could have had some of your men hitch those horses away so that Dutch and his men would have no escape to begin with. But I see they never taught that course in your government training, so I won't persist. Ross says they need to lure Dutch out. So if they remove Dutch's escape, then his men would lock the bank down, making it impossible for the agents to get to Dutch. They said this in the cutscene if you actually paid attention. You're the master now. I've been my master since you left me to die. Except for that little moment where Dutch spared your life by killing that snake Micah Bell. Plus, you can't really claim to be your own master when the government still basically has you by the balls. Killing Micah was for Arthur, he didn't really do it to save John. Dutch still left John during the train robbery, so it's not like John's gonna forgive him. And yes, of course, the government is John's master, he just doesn't like to accept it, he doesn't like saying it. Despite the entrance being the only way in or out of the building, Dutch manages to Houdini his way completely out of Blackwater within a matter of seconds. The agents were focused on the dead girl Dutch had just dropped on them, so of course he managed to escape. You're a public menace. We should have had you killed. Bum, bum, bum. This sin goes on for way too long as it's him just doing the ominous humming. But, I mean, you can't sin foreshadowing. You just can't sin story devices. Because if the story had none of this, you'd be like, oh, it's too simple. It's too boring. There's a reason these exist. There's a reason these devices exist, like foreshadowing and characterization. Can't always fight nature, John. We can't fight change. We can't fight gravity. We can't fight nothing. What a brilliant piece of storytelling this scene is. Dutch, in the moment of truth, finally realizes that his own madness led to his downfall and that his way of life is over. Yet at the same time, he knew the dangers of civilization and reminds us why he chose to live and die as an outlaw. When I'm gone, they'll just find another monster. They have to because they have to justify their wages. Rockstar, congratulations on making one of the greatest villains in video game history. Hats off to you for appreciating Dutch's great writing. Villain falls to their death cliche. It fits Dutch as he wouldn't allow himself to be shot dead. He'd rather just go out on his own terms. Oh, did you think that just because Dutch is now dead, John has redeemed himself and that he's reunited with his family that you reached the end of the game? Welcome to the first of multiple hour-long epilogues of you experiencing John being a family man. Without this epilogue, the game would have felt unfulfilling as we wouldn't even be able to see the family John always talked about. Papa 
thought you was dead! Now why in the hell would you think that when you know that John has been working with the government to take down his former gang? Maybe because she knew how dangerous the old gang was? It's not unreasonable to think that Abigail was kept in the dark about John's progression, so she assumed the worst. An amazing story of how people killed the savage redskins, and how this man, this brave man, hunts the man who killed his father. If I could roll my eyes any harder, they would fall directly out of their sockets. The hell were you thinking going off on your own? I want to know how Jack is still alive. Did the bear just attack him and then leave? Did the bear chase him and then he fell down somewhere? The game kind of skips over that little detail. The bear killed Jack's horse and I'm guessing dragged the horse off to the cave to eat it. Jack then hid behind the rock waiting for something. You think I didn't sit up and listen to Dutch and Bill telling all those stories? And Arthur, and Hosea, and Charles, and Sadie, and Miss Grimshaw, and Pearson, and Tilly. It's strange how you omit all these people, Jack. <sighs> they weren't created yet. Joke goes on for too long. Double sins. Love how the game fails me for letting Uncle die, yet 30 seconds later he ends up dying in a cutscene. It's like, nah, fool. Uncle will die when we say so. To hell with consistency. That's how games work, dingus. They have scripted events. Shit, man. I'm with this, Paul. I'll catch up. You see, John, it's actions like this that make your imminent death all the more irksome and somewhat preachy. Yes, I get it. An outlaw can't outrun his past, the Wild West will soon be tamed, and you did this to protect your family. But by the government killing you and you alone, they end up creating a vengeful son and wife who are still loose ends they didn't tie up. Did they forget that Abigail and Jack were also members of Dutch's gang, thus also making them a liability? Or was it just the writers who forgot that? Contrary to what many of you may think, John's death was not something profound, nor was it tragic. It was stupid gimmicky bullshit. Nothing like a stellar narrative that collapses into absurdity near the end. Plus 10 sins. First off, you sinned John Marston's death, which is not okay. Next, the government is not gonna kill Abigail and Jack. Yes, they're Vandalins, but they're relatively harmless. Why would the government specifically target a, a widow and her son? While they might be evil in the Red Dead universe, they're not straight up heartless. Well. At least most aren't. Ross is, but still. They're not gonna go after every single person. You want them to go after Pearson, the camp chef? That is worth a thousand sins. Hello, sir. You work with the government? Three year difference from 16 to 19 and your voice still sounds the same? Nope. I don't buy it. This is my own personal experience, but I've had the same monotone voice since I was 15. I think three years aren't gonna do much to Jack. Your father killed himself with the life he lived. You killed it! I saw you! Technically, you were quite a distance away when that happened. See how you had to go back to him after you took off? Dude, you get what he means. All's well that ends well. The perfect somber ending. There is that. Everything wrong with, everything wrong with Red Dead 1. Again, don't send hate to GCN. He may be a bit of a dummy, but you know, he doesn't deserve any hate. That's it. That's the end of this, but you know, join the disc. We got some, we got the homies popping. You know, follow the tick is going crazy. The YouTube, we almost got 600, which I, I will do a special for this, but only because I missed one for 500. I was going to reveal something, but I'll just do it for 600. You know, we keep going, we keep hustling. Peace out and goodbye.